Right, moving swiftly on, the final, final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 9310 in the name of Fiona MacLeod on action on hearing loss and the benefits of its Here to Help service. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Fiona MacLeod to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I begin by thanking those members who signed my motion across the party so that we could hold this debate in Parliament this evening? Can I also thank the members who will be speaking in the debate and who have stayed to listen to the opening contributions? Can I also thank the Minister for meeting with the volunteers from Action for Hearing Loss earlier this afternoon? And of course, can I welcome to the gallery many of the volunteers and their supporters, who I presume are with them, um, supporters both human and canine. Um, I would also like to welcome Delia Henry, the Scottish Director of Action for Hearing Loss, and her staff, and to thank her and her staff for the effort they put into producing the briefing for this afternoon, which I think was incredibly helpful for a lot of members. And I think I'm right in also welcoming Paul Breckel, who is the Chief Executive up from London. Um, so thank you for joining us. You didn't need your passport, and you still won't in September. <laughs> um, presiding officer, I first met uh, the volunteers of Action on Hearing Loss and the Here to Help service at the Colsyth Road sheltered housing complex in my constituency. And on that day, um, Action for Hearing Loss was celebrating a birthday. So they were not only there to help the, member, the people that lived in the sheltered housing with their um, hearing aids, but also to celebrate. So we had a birthday cake, which was a nice introduction to a very good group of volunteers. And that was also the first time that I met Irene and Muffin, her hearing dog, who have inspired me to do as much as I can to help this uh, charity. Um, along the way, I've hosted two fringe meetings for them at the SNP. I've attended their drop-in sessions in my constituency in Kirk and Tillich Library and in Bishop Briggs Library. Indeed, just before Christmas, when I went to the Bishop Briggs Library drop-in, there was no birthday cake this time. It was sweeties and Santa hats. So this is a group of volunteers who really know what they're doing, but also know how to welcome people um, along to their drop-in services. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to say that in 2012, our Irene and Muffin uh, were awarded the NHS Volunteer of the, of the Year Award in Scotland for all the work that they're doing. So across my constituency, in the last 10 months, there have been 145 people attending drop-in sessions. We don't just have the drop-in sessions, there's also work done in Camp View Nursing Home and in two sheltered housing complexes. And this is such important work for a lot of reasons. Having the drop-in for people to come who need their hearing aids retubed or batteries put in, having that locally makes it so much easier for people to be able to get along and make sure that everything's working okay. Having volunteers doing this work brings the personal touch to it because many of the volunteers are also hearing aid users themselves. So they bring the personal touch, but they also are trained to do their job well. But they can bring the hints and tips that they know that they can give to the people attending the drop-ins. But they're also increasingly working with other services. And for example, just last week, Esther Ranson from Silverline was in Parliament last week and was talking about the work that they're doing with action and hearing loss. And the biggest most important part here is that if your hearing aid fits properly and performs to its maximum, then you'll use your hearing aid. And you won't be like my father-in-law who kept his hearing aid in a drawer to keep it good. <laughs> that doesn't work. And it's also important because deafness is, is and a an, uh, disability associated with ageing. And we all know across this chamber that we are looking at an ageing population. Therefore, we'll be looking at more and more people with uh, a, a hearing loss. And a hearing loss can be incredibly socially isolating. 
Um, so we have to work on that. But also from my family's personal experience as well, a hearing loss can be masked um, by other problems. If you have dementia, it's not always easy to know that someone's got a hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So these drop-in sessions locally with people that are trusted um, are incredibly important. And this is about the voluntary sector working in partnership with the National Health Service, something that we across this chamber all support. It also helps to meet the Scottish Government's elements of the Scottish Government's See Here strategy that was launched, I think, just last week. And if I can give the chamber some statistics on the sort of um, work that Here to Help has done over the last few years, there's been 13,868 interventions to support hearing aid wearers. There have been drop-in sessions in 52 community venue venues. Here to Help volunteers have contributed 16,000 hours, which equates to £122,400 worth of work. So th th this is incredibly important work. There are four projects across Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Tayside, Borders and uh, Ayrshire and Arran. So from the statistics I've given, I've shown that this is a valuable service that is used well, that is also saving the National Health Service money. So if I, I, I'd like to just come to a conclusion by asking why, for yet another year, some health boards are having to be chased to get the funding for this incredibly useful service. So my plea to the health boards would be, you know it makes sense, it makes sense financially, it makes sense clinically and it makes sense socially for hearing aid we wearers. So please, health boards, just sort it. And to go beyond the four that are doing it and are experiencing this, the benefits, don't just sort the finances. Go out and spread the word to other health boards around the country. So, presiding officer, can I again thank members for being here this, this evening and contributing to this debate. But most, most importantly, can I again thank the volunteers for the amazing work that they do across our communities. And can I finish with an invite to the reception that I will be holding for Action on Hearing Loss here in Parliament on Tuesday evening, the 20th of May, Committee Room 2. Everybody's welcome to come along and hear the personal experiences of the volunteers. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you for the commercial. I uh, now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I congratulate my colleague Fiona McLeod on securing this debate. The data from the 2011 Scottish Census, where for the very first time the question was asked whether someone had a partial hearing loss or deafness, established that just under 351,000 of the population at that time did. 7% of the population. And when I look at my own constituents in Midlothian, South Tweedale and Lauderdale, 5,194 on that census uh, suffered from partial hearing or deafness. At that time, one in 10 of my electorates. That's a substantial number of people. And it's growing, of course, because, and thankfully, we're, as we grow older, we do intend to lose some of our hearing faculties. So I commend Action on Hearing Loss for this, and I'm also here to help uh, projects, in particular the fact that it started in the Scottish Borders in 2007, and I think in rural areas in particular, it's very important that these are accessible when travelling distances is it's such a difficulty for people. During that time, Here to Help has had four, gone to 14 quarterly care home visits, since 2009, they've run 305 drop-in sessions, retubed 3,500 hearing aids and distributed approximately 9,200 packets of hearing aid batteries. It's very practical stuff. And as Fiona McLeod said, it's volunteers who are delivering this service. They have, and they're here to help volunteers, 18 active volunteers delivering 5,500 hours of volunteering time. Now, all that volunteering is free. And it's not just free in delivering a service from people who often themselves have suffered from a hearing impairment and therefore they know what they're talking about. And people who know what they're talking about are people that are paid attention to. They know about people concealing it. They know about people who feel they're isolated. People who are perhaps ashamed that their hearing is becoming impaired. So they're able to break down those barriers. 
and they're also saving the National Health Service and NHS borders, in this instance, a great deal of money and resources in delivering these. So I congratulate them very much on what they're doing. Now I want to move on to a, a, a new an initiative, not a new initiative, kind of such a thing. There's no such thing as an old initiative. An initiative, that's a tautology. And that is BLISS, which is the, an acronym for the Borders Local Integrated Sensory Service. Quite a mouthful. I'm glad they call themselves BLISS. And that's where action on hearing loss has combined with the RNIB, Royal National Institute for the Blind, to deliver services in the main street. Again, important. Not hidden away, but in the main street, 46 of High Street, Gallashields, just down the road from my own office. And I'm delighted to say I visited it, along with other MSPs and MPs, to the opening of their office, which is nice, it's shiny, it's attractive, and it has information, it's practical information. It tells people where to go to various places for help, but it also has little rooms for private meetings, so it has privacy as well. And I think that that's probably one of the ways forward in this difficult time of funding, which you're quite right to raise, because I know that uh, help, uh, Here to Help is short of funding, it loses it in June. I also know that Bliss itself is challenging with its funding, so perhaps in some areas this is the way forward. And in that particular organisation, volunteers have given up 10,000 hours to support people. They have 60 volunteers combining RNIB and here to help to provide services people. And of course, some people suffer from both as they get older. So I think it's very much to be commended. And before I finish, I want to commend back to some volunteers because they're the unsung heroes. I'm going to mention them. Uh, Sybil King, Jean Gibson, Eileen Frame from the borders, and Rob Marr, who's not a borderer, he comes, unfortunately, from East Lothian. Somebody has to come from East Lothian. But he volunteers in West Linton, Peebles and Inner Leithen. They're the salt of the earth. They're the people, unlike us, who get paid and get some recognition, who do this quietly, but deliver something very practical and useful to people who very much need it and are thankful for it. So I congratulate you on the debate. And I think it's time that we recognise the effort put in by volunteers and minister. Uh, we would like some money, please. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Now I call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Nigel Dodd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to congratulate Fiona MacLeod on securing the debate um, and pay tribute to the work on, of action in, on hearing loss and the support service here to help, which, given by the contributions in the debate and certainly from what we hear about the service, is a lifeline to the many people who use hearing aids in our communities. And I very much hope that the funding that Christine Graham was asking for will be rolled out so that people, especially in constituencies and uh, regions such as mine, where people don't have easy access to aud audiology services, could benefit from this, this very useful um, project. It's hard to imagine how isolating the loss of hearing will be and can be. Um, the ability no longer to be able to enter into conversation. All the interactions that we take for granted by hearing and listening to what people are saying and making our own contribution are lost. Add to that that in much of those cases, people are elderly at a difficult time in their life. Maybe they've lost a partner and um, they're losing their mobility. They're maybe losing their independence and the very frustration of not being able to um, express themselves and hear the reaction to that must be very difficult for people in that situation. And I think it was Fiona that mentioned uh, the Silver Line um, discussions of the cross-party group last week. Um, the Silver Line is a telephone helpline. If you suffer from hearing loss, even accessing those very simple services that are out there is no longer available. Also, it's very difficult to access information. So I think we, take, uh, we need to take very seriously the impact on somebody's life of loss of hearing. And I have a friend who lost her sight um, in adulthood and often said as a plus point, if there is a plus point to losing her sight, um, that she was glad it was her sight she lost rather than her hearing if there was a choice between the two, because at least she could still have interaction with friends and the like. Um, and that kind of says how difficult it must be um, to lose your hearing. I think it's really important that we have early intervention, that we 
um, identify people who are going to suffer uh, from hearing loss and also give them access to services in a timely manner. I remember uh, my father beginning to lose his hearing and going to clinics and the like, begging for a hearing aid, and nobody would give him a hearing aid. They said he wasn't ready for it yet and the like. This went on and on. Eventually he got a hearing aid. Um, and it wasn't that very long hours after it had been fitted that we discovered it was in his pocket and he said it was better off quiet just because it had been quiet for so long that he was no longer able to use the hearing aid and get the full benefit of it and I think that was quite sad had he had it some years before I think it would have made a big difference um, to, to his life so I think we need to look at screening need to look at access and make sure that people have early access um, we also need and I think this is part of the Here to Help project um, to look at how we cater for that elderly population which maybe can't access audiology services very easily because they can't travel into towns and maybe live long distances. They need help with maintenance, eh, with battery care, because they're maybe not able to easily take on the new technology. And that's where Here to Help really comes into its own, um, helping those people get the maximum benefit from their hearing aids when they get it. We also have to look at other things as well. And if we are able to um, identify people early on, looking at things like um, British Sign Language, for instance, I think learning and teaching that much earlier on, um, so it becomes kind of natural to people. So once hearing loss um, becomes apparent, that maybe picking that up and honing those skills, if they were already learned and, and taught, uh, would be much easier. And also things like lip reading that would allow people to communicate as well. I think all those things we have to look at, but I think we need to also look after our hearing because it's very precious. And I hope that um, the Minister will look at ways of rolling out the, the Here to Help scheme to other parts of Scotland. Many thanks. I call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I too congratulate Fiona MacLeod on bringing this important debate, actually. And this is, it's really good that we do this kind of thing. I think she's adequately summed up what Here to Help is actually about. And that's uh, clearly one of the things that Action on Hearing Loss do. Um, and, and I clearly want to support that. I really want to emphasize, though, that it's uh, important that we get uh, some early uh, analysis of, of people's problems as we possibly can. Um, Christine Graham commented that we were looking at, uh, at an aging population. Well, I look at an aging population every time I look in the mirror. Uh, and I was thinking of hanging around and make, keeping it that way. And I, what I know about my family history tells me that if I do manage to stick around, not only will I be a bigger pain, but actually probably won't hear as well either. Now, I'm one of those people who, because he damaged his ear, as I've, I've told the, the chamber before now, got to a hearing aid relatively early in life, and that does give me some advantages on occasions. Um, but part of the problem which we have evaluated, I think, is that people who don't get looked at early enough and diagnosed early enough, then, as Rhoda Grant has just pointed out, I get so used to their impaired hearing that they struggle to work with a hearing aid when they get there. And this was the subject of an extremely interesting discussion, which we had at the most recent party conference, as it happens, where I convened a meeting for a change. Um, so we're beginning, I think, to understand that it's important that we do early diagnosis. Spending to save really is what it's about. And, and I say that knowing fine well that the minister understands that. The Scottish Government has got that. I'm, I, I know I'm preaching to the converted there. Uh, and this particular subject of, of uh, here to help, um, I, again, I would want to commend the, those who, who work in this, the volunteers who come to my constituency. I know there are sessions in, in Brechin Library, library the, the Lynx Health Centre in Montrose and in Whitehills Health Centre in, in Forfa. Uh, and, but I do share the concerns that this needs to be properly funded. Um, and if we're not sure whether in that particular context Angus Council is going to fund it, then I really do need to encourage them to do so. But I also look further north in my constituency that Aberdeenshire doesn't appear to be signed up to this. So I find myself saying, dear Aberdeenshire Council, why not? Because I suspect this is really something that they should be doing. Um, I'd also like to, to pick up on, on why it is that people don't go for early diagnosis. And it seems to me that there are a couple of things which, which work, but simply because we're human beings, we tend to compensate. I'm sure when we lose our faculties, we tend then just to, to compensate. We, we learn to lip read, I suspect. Um, and, and we just don't want to believe that we're losing our hearing or possibly our sight or maybe some of our other faculties. 
So there's a lack of awareness of the decay of our abilities. But then I'm sure there's also a fraction of the population who know perfectly well that they can't hear or see as well as they could, but actually just don't believe anybody cares or anybody will do anything about it or anything much can be done. So I'm sure that part of what we have to do is encourage those who are aware of their problem actually to find ways of getting it diagnosed and getting, it, getting help. And that was one of the themes of that aforementioned meeting, that probably we need to be doing as much as we can in the high streets to enable people to, to go into the chemists and get a hearing test just simply to find out how good or bad it is in such a way that they can then, without too much effort, understand that they have a problem and then be signposted in the right direction. Uh, Fiona McLeod was good enough to invite us to a reception. I wrote it down as Tuesday the 28th of May, is that right? The 20th of May, right, would you see? It's important we get that right, but I'd also like to give you an another date because I really would like to invite anybody who has any interest in this to come to the Webster Theatre in our broth on Sunday, June the 8th. Now, I'm saying this partly because that will be the first and only scheduled performance of a musical that I've written about Mr. Burns. But much more importantly in the context, and this is not irrelevant, it's an opportunity I'm going to take to actually raise some money for action on hearing loss. Because that's actually a, a charity which I genuinely want to support. It works in the area. Uh, and we're all getting older. Actually, our faculties are not going to get any better. This is irreversible, guys. And therefore, I think any money that's put into this very worthy charity has got to be a really good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Colin Jackson Carlow to be followed by Willie Coffey. A presiding officer, can I thank those members for the tourist information bulletins that have peppered this afternoon's debate? Can I thank Fiona McLeod for having secured it? Can I unreservedly, in fact, acknowledge and uh, congratulate the Scottish Government on the uh, action plan that they have launched and the funding that they have put towards it? This is one other of those issues where I think this Parliament has demonstrated it has the luxury of time to pause, reflect and debate and come forward with strategies on issues which I think otherwise tend to be marginalised and overlooked. And I think that the action plan of the government is to be commended. I'd also particularly like to acknowledge Action and Hearing Loss, Delia Henry and her team. Um, and, to, and at the same time also I'd like to uh, pay tribute to the Donaldson School for the Deaf which has inter acted with members of this parliament on a number of occasions to great effect. Now, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. I do want to um, do all I can to support and encourage people to take advantage of the Here to Help campaign. I visited one of the uh, local um, operations in uh, the west of Scotland in the village of Neilston. Uh, and I think it's important to emphasise this is not some great big grand enterprise. It's a highly practical uh, operation with volunteers who are there to assist. And um, when I went along, I was invited, if I wished, to see if there was anything I could do. Uh, I have to say I'm so ham-fisted on these occasions that I decided it probably would not be to the advantage of anybody's hearing aid to let me loose on it at all. But it did bring home to me how pernickety and fiddly this work is, and therefore how vital it is that there is a service, in this case supported by so many volunteers, which will allow this very important cleaning and renewal of um, the battery service on hearing aids to be undertaken effectively because you know being ham-fisted as I am the easiest thing to do is to irreparably damage the hearing aid or if you don't have the confidence as a result not to have it properly serviced so that it's rendered ineffective so these um, voluntary groups who are operating in all the locations that have been mentioned to across Scotland uh, are providing a vital service and we need to do everything we can to promote it to make sure that people appreciate that actually there probably is access to such a service very near to them um, I also want to say something about On The Move, which is another of the campaigns that they are promoting in relation to uh, information and access for 16 to 25-year-olds. I was very struck, it had a profound impact on me on visiting the Donaldson School for the Deaf, of a, a sculpture in the entrance foyer, I think it's of a pair of hands, uh, from a very talented pupil who was uh, a star of the Donaldson School for the Deaf, who was then able to go to Aberdeen University uh, in the expectation of taking forward and fulfilling a very meaningful career there, but who was crushed, whose confidence was crushed because of the lack of an ongoing service for people of his age uh, when he got there to the extent that he eventually had uh, a complete loss of confidence and withdrew. And that is why I don't think anything could demonstrate more the need for us to ensure a continuity of care in order that young people moving into the uh, world of work and employment, who have that talent and wish to contribute, don't find themselves wholly marginalised because of a lack of sensitivity and understanding 
of others who in somehow misjudge that uh, impairment as being somehow a lack of ability or intelligence or willingness to participate. It must really be soul-destroying when that talent exists, not to be able to take advantage of it. Now, we've heard, um, I agree with what Rona Grant said, Rhoda Grant said about sign language. Uh, when the Donaldson School for the Deaf were in here, they were teaching members a little bit of signage. I've forgotten it all, but the point was it wasn't very difficult, actually, to pick up some basic signing, and I think that it would be useful for more people to be uh, talented and be able to participate at that level. Uh, the, me the challenge of demographics has been mentioned once again. Yes, the ageing population this is, after all, also an ageing parliament, and many of us feel that ministers are serially deaf to all the pleas that we often make. But in this instance, I think we can say that the government has responded effectively, and I think this is a very important matter which Fiona McLeod's uh, motion this afternoon has given us a chance to articulate and give further support to. So I congratulate her on that, and I also welcome the efforts the government are making. Many thanks. Now call on Willie Coffey, after which we'll move to the closing speech from the minister. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer, <coughs> and I would add my thanks and congratulations to my colleague Fiona MacLeod too for securing this member's debate on this really important, if sometimes overlooked, subject of hearing loss and of course to commend the work carried out by Action on Hearing Loss across Scotland. Uh, like other members, I'm grateful to Alan Dale, the Communications and Campaigns Manager for Action on Hearing Loss, for drawing to our attention the range of support services that the organisation provides to people. What struck me first was that it's mostly the small interventions that often make most difference. Basic maintenance, like replacing tubes and batteries mentioned by Jackson Carlaw there, uh, and cleaning out ear moulds mean that people with a hearing impairment don't need to attend hospitals for these sorts of things. And there are a number of advantages to that. It means, of course, that people don't need to make journeys to hospital, to audiology departments, which allows staff there to concentrate much more on the clinical side of, of that work. But possibly of even greater importance is the, that people with hearing impairment can feel comfortable about dropping into the various here to help locations, to meet, to discuss issues, to get advice and guidance on a variety of subjects. All of this is extremely valuable and makes an even bigger contribution to a sense of well-being. It helps reduce the isolation that is all too often felt by people with sensory impairments. Um, I'm delighted to learn that there are two here to help services currently operating in Kilmarnock, one in the town centre and one up in Onthank, where I grew up, uh, with another planned for the town of New Mills. And I'm also delighted to learn that two volunteers from my constituency, Katrina Hislop and Wilma Anderson, are in the gallery tonight. So a very warm welcome to both of them. Presiding officer, I was taken aback when I read that in Scotland there are 850,000 people with some level of hearing loss. And the impact this has in the lives of people often goes far beyond the disability itself. To illustrate what I mean, some time ago I had the privilege of attending a question and answer session with members of the Ayrshire Mission for the Deaf. Their first message to me through their interpreter was to keep things as simple as possible, not to use complex words and concepts, and of course try to speak slowly for those also trying to lip read. It became obvious to me that people with hearing loss and hearing impairment can face an ever-widening circle of exclusion because they can't interpret language and its complexities as quickly as others can. For example, forms are, are more difficult, if not impossible, to understand. Queuing up in any kind of setting, for example, in a job centre, in council offices, in shops or pubs, all become incredibly stressful because more time is needed to explain and more time is needed to understand so people with hearing loss and impairment often give up on these types of interaction altogether. The language in newspapers is often far too complex, and even our party political leaflets are almost unintelligible to people with hearing impairments. Perhaps no great surprise there, but it certainly made me think carefully about how we can communicate our ideas as simple as possible. All of these, presiding officer, lead to further isolation, and that's why I think the work carried out by Action in Hearing Loss and the Here to Help projects is so important. Bringing people together helps to overcome many of these problems, and it certainly helps to hold back further exclusion, which will inevitably get worse if we were to lose services like these. Can I finally thank my colleague Fiona MacLeod for bringing to the Parliament's attention the issues surrounding hearing loss, and to commend the work done by Action in Hearing Loss throughout 
Scotland for the valuable contribution they make to enriching the lives of those with a hearing disability. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Minister Michael Matheson to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes or thereby, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I like others uh, thank Fiona McLeod for bringing this debate forward here tonight and to congratulate her on securing time and support for her motion. Uh, she made reference in her own contribution. I had the uh, pleasure of launching the uh, See Here, uh, Scotland's National Sense Impairment Strategy, just last uh, Thursday. Uh, the strategy is uh, one which has been developed in close collaboration uh, with partner organisations right across the country, from local authorities, our health boards, the third sector, uh, both uh, small and large third sector organisations. And I want to take this opportunity to also place on record my thanks to Action on Hearing Loss for their invaluable and their uh, insightful uh, contribution to the development of the national strategy uh, and also to their commitment uh, in helping to take it forward to the most important element of the strategy, its implementation, taking the words from the page and turning them into real action on the ground. See here uh, is the first uh, sensory impairment strategy of its kind, not just here in Scotland, but anywhere in the UK. And it recognises the need to make sure uh, that we give the right support and assistance to approximately 850,000 uh, people with a hearing loss in Scotland, as well as those with a visual or a visual impairment or a deaf uh, blind impaired. And it's there to help to support those with a hearing loss or a visual impairment, whether it be mild or profound. Moreover, it considers also the risks of sensory loss and those who may be living with a hidden or an untreated sensory loss. The very point that Nigel Dawn raised in his own contribution, a group who are particularly vulnerable to this are older people in our care homes. And it's important we make sure that given that they are vulnerable uh, to uh, having a hidden or untreated sensory loss, that they get access to the right type of services and assessment in order to address their sensory loss. The key emphasis is to deliver positive, person-centred outcomes through partnership working that will improve outcomes at a local level. This will allow the seamless provision of assessment, care and support to both children and adults living with a sensory impairment. And in delivering uh, this uh, important local partnership, uh, local partnership working will be absolutely crucial so that all partners are engaged in working together with each other, local authority, health board and the third sector to make sure that they have a joint plan on how they will take that forward at a local level. The very point that Christine Graham was making her own contribution about that need to have joint planning and joint working. And if we get that right, we can then deliver a much more integrated, efficient and also effective delivery of care and support to people who are living and experiencing sensory loss and impairment. However, delivery, uh, delivering significant and tangible improvements to the provision of care will count for absolutely nothing unless there is an uh, equity of uh, improvement around how services are affecting on the ground and how that improves the quality of life for individuals living with or experiencing a sensory loss. Now, uh, Fiona McLeod uh, made reference to uh, the fact that I had the uh, pleasure of meeting with a number of the volunteers uh, who are involved in uh, Here to Help uh, across the country earlier on today from Glasgow, Tayside, Borders and from Ayrshire Arn. And how could I not mention Muffin and Callie, their two canine helpers? Uh, their work uh, in delivering the initiative uh, clearly demonstrates uh, the importance of effective, good local partnership working and the impact that that work can actually have on someone's day-to-day -day life. Fiona McLeod, in her own contribution, also uh, was right to highlight the uh, Here to Help initiative offers a, a variety of community-based uh, provision, drop-in centres, outreach and uh, home services. And volunteers work across their own local NHS board area. And in doing that, they help to relieve some of the pressure that's experienced by our own audi audiology services uh, from uh, repeated requests. So in that sense, the service helps to maximise the potential gains for the local community through local volunteers 
who can help to support and assist those with a hearing impairment. Fru MacLeod and others were also quite right uh, to state uh, in the course of the debate about how this particular initiative is also proving to be invaluable in helping to improve the quality of life of so many service users who use hearing aids across the country. And the See Here strategy looks to support this very approach, develop and also to enhance this type of local service delivery that improves services across the board. And it's important we make sure that that translates into real tangible improvement on at the ground for service users. In considering the current local service delivery models, which are operating in different levels across the country, and I recognise that there are some of our health boards who are more proactive than others, and I would encourage all of them to look at this particular approach as a mechanism that can help to improve the way in which they deliver audiology services within their own area. But in taking forward the new strategy, a key part of that will be to make sure that look at what the provision is on the ground at the present time. So, for example, the work that's been taken forward by Action on Hearing Loss and other organisations, and it take that into account and include it into any new care pathway that's developed as part of the new strategy. Just like the Bliss service that operates in Gala Shields, which I had the pleasure of opening back in 2000. In 11 is a good example of the type of service that the new strategy wants to build upon in order to develop further. And the funding that has been delivered alongside this strategy is to help to increase that capacity further. Senator Officer, and drawing my remarks to a close, I want to uh, make mention of action on hearing loss and the way in which they have gone about helping to effect change in this particular area. I am uh, more than happy to put on record my appreciation of the work that they do right across the country through initiatives such as Here to Help. Moreover, their continuing contribution to the implementation of our new national sensory impairment strategy will be both invaluable and be very much appreciated. And I am certain that within the collaborative and the innovative framework created by the See Here strategy, that Here to Help will continue to flourish in its in the way in which it delivers benefits to local service users. Dean officer, I also want to finish by simply thanking Action on Hearing Loss and the Help to Hear volunteers for all of their dedication and their work over the years. And I certainly wish them well in taking that forward in the weeks, months and years ahead. Many, many thanks. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you all.